if you don't know, um, my name is Kate and I'm one of the nutritionists at On Point Nutrition. We are a Philadelphia based company, though we are 100% virtual. We have always been virtual, even um, before the pandemic, which actually um, kind of actually worked you know, to our advantage just because we never saw clients in person. So I feel like our clients had a little bit more time maybe to devote to their nutrition counseling by, um, you know, maybe working from home and whatnot. So um, we meet with clients through Zoom and we've just been working from home and um, talk to clients essentially all over the world. As you can kind of see right now, everybody it seems is Zooming from the US, but on the last um, webinar we had people, I think there was somebody, there was somebody in Europe and somebody in Canada, which was really neat. So a lot of our clients are um, Zooming from those places when we talk to them during the day. So we have a range of people who are looking for weight loss, disease management, or just nutrition education. So if you're not an on-point nutrition client already and you're looking to get more information, um, please do reach out and um, schedule a free consultation with our team. I am one of the client arm onboarding specialists, so maybe I would be a person that you speak to and um, I would be happy to. So what I want to talk to everybody about today is intuitive eating and we're going to go a little bit more into um, some of the later principles of um, fullness and um, stress eating and um, kind of like recapping some of the stuff that we talked about from last week just in case anybody is joining us and didn't see last week's presentation. So um, just want to make sure that we kind of like catch everybody up first. So I just want to do like a little bit of a brief, brief recap first. So the way that I started off last week's presentation was I just asked everybody what they knew about intuitive eating. As we go, I might ask you for comments, questions, feedback. Um, last week was great because a lot of people were sharing stories about growing up maybe in a diet culture world or household and um, growing up in a diet culture environment, maybe with their parents. So um, that was really interesting. So if anybody wants to share a story or an experience, um, you can send it through the chat box and I'd be happy to share that with the group. Um, like I said, I'm gonna keep everybody on mute and keep everybody's videos off, but feel free to do that. So I'm just gonna get started here. I'm gonna share my screen with everybody and just give me one minute to get that populated for you. So if anybody wants to share in um, anything that they know about intuitive eating um, or what you think intuitive eating is um, or, you know, like what your idea of intuitive eating is essentially. Anybody have any ideas? This is like in school when nobody wants to answer. <laughs> and, and now I can't hear or see anybody, so nobody's laughing at my um, corny jokes. So, okay, we got a couple. So let's see. Um, listening to your body, one person said, um, eating when you feel hungry and stopping when you're full, being aware of hunger and eating then. I think that these are all kind of like along the same lines, listening to your body. Following your body's lead. I like that one. Following your body's lead. I don't really think that there's a wrong answer here. I just wanted to see what you guys, um, what your thoughts are on intuitive eating. This is something that I think is becoming more mainstream as diet culture begins to kind of like fade out and people are tired of it and um, it's nonsensical. Being aware of hunger and eating then. I like that. So um, on point nutrition, really values the education of staff, of the staff, and, um, you know, wants 
all of the staff to be educated and wants um, all of us to, you know, our founder wants us to do the, follow the, uh, the lead of the things that we're interested in. So I became really interested in intuitive eating this year and I did read the book intuitive eating and um, I signed up for Christy Harrison's course who I reference in my slides here. And um, she has the podcast Food Psych. So I recommend that too, if you want some extra resources on intuitive eating. So she's really great. And um, so I did her course this year, which um, you know is giving us a lot of great resources. So um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm referencing here. But um, kind of just to bring this back to what we did last week, I just want to highlight um, what intuitive eating is and the principles of it, just kind of like brush over this because I know we, we did this last week for anybody who joined us. We went through what intuitive eating is, what it's not, comparing it to diet culture. And then we went through, um, you know, like some of the principles. But this week, I want to focus a little bit more on stress eating and dive into some of the later principles a little bit more for anybody who's joining us this week, just to kind of brush this over. Um, to answer everybody's question, it's kind of the default mode. So we are all born knowing how to eat. Think about a baby. They cry when they're eat. They stop when they're full. Somewhere along the line, that kind of gets pushed aside. So the word intuitive itself means instinctual. It's, it's really just eating. The only reason we even need to call this intuitive eating is because of diet culture. This is really just eating. The only reason that there needs to be a name for it is because there needs to be a name for everything because there needs, you need to call every diet something because of the way the world is. So it's not necessarily a diet plan, a program, a protocol. It's, it's not following anything like that. It's essentially the default mode. So somewhere along the line, being immersed in diet culture, um, the default mode gets pushed aside by a toxic belief system about food. So it's really eating what you want, when you want, and kind of like trusting your body and your mind. So somebody had mentioned trusting your body, listening to your hunger signals, trusting your body to make that mind-body connection. So your choices are coming from a place of self-care Eating is self-care instead of a place of self-control, which is, you know, when people are intermittent fasting, um, the time that they eat controls something about their diet. When somebody is um, on keto, they're controlled by carbohydrates. Um, so food choices are coming from a place of self-control when you're on a diet. Intuitive eating is your food choices are coming from a place of self-care. And I, I just made a note that nutrition is not disregarded. So somebody who eats intuitively is not just like eating cupcakes all day, eating pizza all day. Um, eating intuitively still means like listening to your body and honoring the things that you want to eat. But that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're kind of just eating junk food all the time. It might seem like you would do that maybe in the beginning. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later, but um, it won't necessarily be like that. Yeah, um, Randy had mentioned gentle nutrition. So <clears throat> she just mentioned that to the group. Um, so essentially, it's not disregarded, but it's not such a strict um, kind of rule. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking about nutrients, but there's not such stringent guidelines around things. So intuitive eaters enjoy a variety of different foods, not just one food group over another. So instead of using rules to dictate your food choices, you shift the focus and you're listening to your intuition and you don't have guilt. So it's not really an eating until your full diet. It's more so, you know, you listening to your hunger signals, honoring that, doing away with the guilt, and kind of um, moving on from there. Somebody mentioned it's helping them think about eating what you need, less about craving, 
kind of want but body needs. So I think you're just um, thinking about, you know, think tuning into listening to what your body needs and not really cravings. I think that's what I got from that. Anybody just feel free to send questions or comments along the way too. So I just threw this slide in here about um, intuitive eating versus dieting, just to kind of like clear that up a little bit. Intuitive eating, you know, side by side here. Intuitive eating versus dieting. Intuitive eating encourages you to listen to your hunger and fullness signals. Okay, what I mean by that is a lot of times when people first start working with our team, first start working with dietitian, a lot of people will say they don't recognize themselves as being hungry. They don't recognize themselves as feeling hungry. So um, you might not recognize when you feel hunger and fullness. So that's something that you kind of like want to tune back into. On the diet end of things, you're following rules and restrictions. So it, with intuitive eating, you're encouraged to listen to your body. Again, choices are coming from self-care, not self-control. Intuitive eating, you're focusing on how food makes you feel. With dieting, you're focusing on how food makes you look a lot of times. Um, or like, you know, how you, how you might perceive yourself to look. Um, and with intuitive eating, you're focusing on making nourishing food choices. As um, Randy had mentioned, gentle nutrition. We're focusing on variety, a variety of foods nutrients. With dieting, usually we're focusing on restrictions. We're focusing on all the things that we can't do, not all the, the things that we can do. And then um, with intuitive eating, we're honoring our hunger, uh, I'm sorry, we're honoring our, our hunger with, without guilt and limitations. And then with dieting, we feel guilty about hunger and fullness and eating too much or the wrong things. So, you know, it, it, if this might seem kind of like foreign to people or impossible at first, especially after like years of yo-yo dieting or an immersion in diet culture, but over time it becomes easier and cravings and binges ultimately subside because that's kind of what happens with yo-yo dieting is it's extreme um, restriction until ultimately you end up overeating. So dieting makes you feel like you fail when you mess up and it makes you feel like you're doing good when you eat clean, which is also restricting essentially. Because what is clean? What does that really even mean? And I think you have to um, ask yourself a lot of the times, what does that do for you? Does that add benefit to your life? Because diet culture really steals your happiness, essentially. A lot of times when you're fixated on calories or staying within macronutrient levels or um, really like focusing on clean, you're unable to find joy in things that involve food. A lot of times when people first start working with us, they have a lot of anxiety surrounding food, parties, celebrations, and things that are meant to be happy. And food is supposed to be pleasurable and bring us happiness. So a lot of times there's a lot of anxiety and fear with social events. Think about, too, what happens after the 30 days is over with these, like, 30-day diets or two-week cleanse. Like, what happens then? You, you know, this isn't teaching you anything. That's the issue on-point nutrition and kind of like our philosophy is our main goal is to teach you why you're doing what you're doing. Understanding how your body reacts to the food you eat. Nutrition counseling is kind of completely different from following a fad diet. So um, Randy had made the point, is on-point's program already influenced by intuitive eating? And I truly believe it's, it's kind of a blend. Um, a lot of our clients are you know, following an on point um, or on point, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, are on point clients because they have a goal of weight loss. But I think a lot of on point clients have a goal of food relationship repair. And there is a lot of root in what we do coming from intuitive eating. You know, 
we question a lot of people to, or push a lot of people to focus on the issues that cause stress eating, or a lot of people come to us and say they're emotional eaters and they want to just, you know, place foods as off limits, but that actually makes things worse. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, so I think you kind of have to dig into the root of the issues in order to solve that. And that's actually allowing yourself to eat off limits foods instead of creating more restrictions, which is kind of what diet culture does. So we try to do the opposite with, with our clients. So think about how much time you spend thinking about food choices or food and think about how much energy is put into negative thoughts. You could be using that energy for something like a new hobby or time with your family or friends. And studies show that dieting will actually cause you to gain weight in the long run because they don't teach you anything and you never really get to the root of that issue of your relationship with food. So, um, feel free to kind of like send comments as we go. Um, sorry, I had skipped ahead, but the next, the next thing that I wanted to kind of just go over again, um, I know we talked about this again last week, but the 10 principles of intuitive eating are number one, reject the, men the diet mentality. So stop letting diet culture tell you what's good and bad. The weight loss industry is a billion dollar a year industry that's not looking out for you. So break free from that and learn to listen to your body. Number two is honor your hunger. So energy from food, mainly from carbohydrates, is your body's main source of fuel. When you restrict your intake, your body is programmed to want to overeat when you finally do in order to survive. That's just how it is. If you constantly don't give yourself enough when you finally do eat, you will overeat. Is our primal instinct. Once you do get to that point of starvation, all point of reason goes out the window when you finally do set, sit down to eat. So the way that you avoid that is to honoring your hunger and listening to your hunger signal when it does come up. Number three is making peace with food. Give yourself permission to eat all foods. When you set limits and categorize foods as good and bad, the limits that you set ultimately force you to want to eat those foods more. So if you forbid certain foods, the uncontrollable cravings will build up. And when you finally allow yourself to eat the forbidden foods, you'll probably end up overeating them when you actually do eat them. So rather, you wanna legalize all foods and learn to eat them in moderation. Ultimately, your cravings and your binging will subside. And you, you won't overeat these foods forever, even if you do in the beginning when you first start allowing yourself to eat them. Challenge the food police. So that number four is, is challenge the negative food ads. Outsiders telling you what you should be doing and what's good for you. Unfollow people on social media that are selling teas or you know, feeding you negative energy, telling you what you should be doing, how they got thin quick, or giving you, you know, an idea of what perfection looks like or, or unattainable goals. Number five is discover satisfaction. So food is meant to be pleasurable. When you rediscover how you feel when you eat, it will be easier to determine when you've had enough. Sometimes we don't even like the food that we binge on. We just do it because we put that food as off limits. So we want it. Learn what flavors and food elements you truly enjoy. And then kind of lean into that. Um, somebody just mentioned that they had to go. I, I did um, see your email pop up and I will email you back. Sorry that I have to leave. Um, number six is feel your fullness. So practice listening to your body. Build trust in your body. The way that you do that is just kind of practice. So um, too often diet culture tells us to reject our hunger signals, which ruins our ability to trust our body. 
um, practice by pausing in the middle of eating and check in with yourself. Ask yourself a couple questions. Maybe that's jotting down some notes. Um, if, if you're an on-point nutrition client, there is a note section on your app when you're, you know, when you're logging in your food, you can jot that down. Um, are you interested in what you're eating? Are you closer to feeling full? Do you need more? Are you already full? Ask yourself those questions and kind of like practice feeling your fullness. Number seven, cope with your emotions with kindness. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. Um, I think that that is really um, what we would say is stress eating, comfort eating, emotional eating, binging. Food is comforting, it's true. But it doesn't help you fix your emotions if you're feeling troubled. So you have to get to the root of your issues in a way that doesn't always involve food. It might involve food, but that can't be the fix all the time. It doesn't, it's not gonna fix your problem. Number eight is respect your body. Your body deserves your respect. You only get one. Start with respecting your body. It might even turn into like and love for yourself. Number nine is movement. So um, focus on how movement makes you feel, not how often you think you should be doing it. Too often, I think we get wrapped up in the notion that we should exercise, we should run. I can't tell you the amount of times I talk to clients who say that they are disappointed, they, they should work out, you know, week after week have a, a goal of doing a certain workout, but then continue to not reach it. And then my, my question is, you know, is this something that you actually want to do or is it because you feel like you should? That's not to say that movement isn't good for you, but I think you have to find something that you actually enjoy doing and how that fits your lifestyle and the things that you enjoy doing, things that you like, that you take pleasure in. Number 10 is honor your health. So um, somebody had mentioned gentle nutrition. It's one of the principles. Um, you don't have to be perfect to be healthy. Progress, not perfection. That's something that we hold in high regard. If you overeat one day, you're not suddenly unhealthy or failing or deficient in nutrients. So this is um, the principles of intuitive eating created by Triboli and Raish, the um, dietitian who kind of invented intuitive eating. And you can read more about that on intuitiveeating.org. Does anybody have any questions or comments so far about intuitive eating? Feel free to send a chat. So again, sorry if you were here last week, we went over this a little bit, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a recap in case anybody missed it. Um, so I just wanted to dive in. I know we went over a little bit of um, principles one and two last week, and I wanted to move into principle three. So this is make peace with food. And um, I think that this is really important to, this is like the next step is essentially like legalizing food. And I think that this will kind of help you if you're struggling with stress or binge or emotional eating is to legalize all foods and, and start to eat those off limits foods. So one of the steps is to eat foods that are considered off limits. There's a, deprivation cycle and maybe some of you have had experience being in that where you're in like a cycle where you restrict 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 a food but then end up binge 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 and then eventually the deprivation builds up to such a degree that you give in and end up eating to a point of discomfort often on foods that we would say are forbidden or off limits or on that list, which are usually higher calorie or maybe what you would say not as nutritious. 
the way out of that cycle and the path to a truly peaceful relationship with food is to legalize all foods and give your body and mind time to understand that the cake, the chips, the bread, whatever sweets, whatever's on that list isn't going anywhere. It's not going to be taken away, hopefully. Um, so, you know, it's always going to be there for you. A lot of times um, that's what I try to express to clients is, you know, it, it's not going to be your last day that you can ever have chips ever. They'll always be there for you. So you can stop treating them as if it's going to be your last chance to ever eat them. I think a lot of times we have that mentality um, when it comes to like restriction and binge on them. They're kind of seen like that. So, that, you know, those aren't going anywhere. The process will take a little bit of time. Um, one of the things that you can kind of do is make a list of off limits foods, maybe, and try to introduce them one by one. So I'm sure people can think of foods that they would consider to be maybe off limits. Again, chips, cookies, cake. I've had a lot of clients say there's maybe like a food that they can't keep in the house. Uh, cereal, granola, you eat a whole box of cereal in a day, maybe, whatever, whatever the case. Um, put, make a list. And if you need the support from your dietitian, maybe send the list to your dietitian. Or maybe you think about those foods right now. If anybody wants to send, send the food in right now, feel free to send it. I used to feel this way about um, peanut butter filled pretzels. Has anybody ever had those? They're so good and salty and delicious. I've been in a place like that with those kind of food before cookies, somebody said, felt like, you know, like they were unhealthy or I shouldn't eat them, pretzels. And I would feel like I couldn't buy them because I shouldn't eat them. And then if I did buy them, maybe I would eat too many. But the, the thing to do is actually to include them in your everyday because then you're less likely to overeat them when you do eat them. They're not, they're not so shiny anymore. They're stripped of that forbidden quality. The goal is to strip them of that, not to make you never eat them again. The goal is to incorporate them. So I put on here a bullet, honeymoon phase. Um, Christy Harrison referenced that in, she references that in her podcast and in the course. Um, it's normal. So the honeymoon phase is like when you're, you know, so happy or so in love, right? Um, she references that in the course to say that when you start reintroducing some of these off-limits foods, that maybe you're having a lot of them all the time. So maybe it's, okay, maybe it's, let's use peanut butter pretzels as the example. So let's say that peanut butter pretzels are on my off-limits food list and I start incorporating them and I buy them and I am eating them every day and just going to turn into a peanut butter pretzel. But eventually you're going to get to a point where you will pass. You will actually crave food that weren't previously off limits because you genuinely do want variety. So that honeymoon phase is normal and it will pass in its own time. Legalizing the food in your mind is the key to helping it pass. Eventually, you know, if you're just eating pretzels, if I'm just eating pretzels all the time, eventually I will um, want some variety. I'm not just going to want only that food all the time. And I try to um, explain this to clients a lot too, where it's like brownies, pizza, you know, if you ate pizza for every meal every day, you would eventually want something besides that. I'm sure everybody has seen like that movie, Super Size Me. Um, just, it just came to mind where the, the guy is eating McDonald's for every meal of the day. I think he only made it, he didn't even make it his whole experiment time because he couldn't even handle it. In the beginning, he was loving it. <laughs> 
it's funny because the slogan is, well, I'm loving it. <laughs> um, eating, eating McDonald's three meals a day, just like, yeah, this is great. Delicious. Tastes good. But then he got to a point where he couldn't even like it, he was throwing up eating McDonald's because it was it's too much. Like you you eventually want other things. You need variety. So you essentially my my point is you wouldn't just eat those things all the time. And and that goes back to um my point and to Randy's comment. Um intuitive eaters aren't just sitting around eating junk food all the time. These foods that you once deemed off limits just become part of your normal. And then you're having a variety of foods because your off limits foods are just part of your regular, but you enjoy all foods. Please feel free to send comments. If anybody has a story or any um, comments about anything that happened with them like that, somebody sent in something i try to remember when i want a second helping is that the french's philosophy is that we can always have it tomorrow i try to eat healthy but it doesn't always work for me i think that that's actually kind of a diet culture thought of um we can always have it tomorrow um i see your point and i see i see what you're saying um but, but I think that is, I think that if you still feel genuinely hungry and you still feel a hunger signal, if your stomach is still rumbling and you still feel like you haven't eaten enough and want a second helping, I don't think you should suppress that by saying you can always have it tomorrow. But um, I think that one, you know, if, if you're, if you're agreeing with what I was saying, that food isn't going anywhere and we don't need to binge on it. Um, if you're agreeing with that, then I then I like that comment. Um, so to move on to the next principle to kind of go along with um, honoring your hunger, feeling your fullness. So I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but I wanted to highlight principle six now. So we were just on principle three. I wanted to jump to principle six because I think these are all related to emotional stress, mindless eating, because that's kind of what I wanted to highlight in this webinar. So uh, I think that these are kind of like the most useful things to highlight in this one. So feeling your fullness, diet culture teaches us to be hyper aware of fullness and makes us fixate on it because the message is that eating less is better. So then fullness becomes demonized as a sign that we've eaten too much. And we're therefore supposedly breaking rules if we eat more. So um, to the comment that we just received, if you have a second helping, a lot of times you're seen as breaking the rules or cheating or eating too much. That's why you kind of have to check in with yourself and see if you're actually hungry. And that comes back to the principle of honoring your hunger. And I'm sure if, you, if you're working with our team, your dietitian would certainly tell you to eat if you were hungry. So diet culture teaches us to suppress your hunger. Um, eating past the point of fullness or binging stems from deprivation. So if you have a hard time feeling and listening to your hunger and fullness cue, that would make sense because maybe you have been yo-yo dieting or stuck in maybe that diet culture mentality for a really long time. And an adaptive response to repeatedly eating to the point of uncomfortable fullness is um, to, uh, I'm sorry, eating to a point of uncomfortable fullness is an adaptive response because that's how you respond to binging, um, I'm sorry, re restricting. Eating to that uncomfortable point almost always comes as a reaction to deprivation. So having been deprived in some way beforehand. If you're hungry and you consistently don't allow yourself to eat because of internalized or externalized 
diet culture beliefs, um, you get to the point of such extreme deprivation that it's almost impossible to get yourself to stop eating before you're un un uncontrollably full. Has anybody ever been hangry before? And then you end up kind of like eating everything in sight, so to speak, because that's what your body's programmed to do in order to keep you from starving, essentially. It's a survival mechanism that evolved to keep us safe in times of famine. <laughs> so in the course that I took by um, Chrissy Harrison, she, she came up with a good analogy that I always like to bring up to clients. Um, the restriction pendulum. So think about a pendulum. We know a pendulum swings on a clock, right? So think about a pendulum inside your body. When it's been pulled so far, when your body's been pulled so far over to one side, the side of deprivation, it has no choice but to swing forcefully to the side of extreme fullness. So we want our pendulums to rest in the middle, but it doesn't. They swing with force to the other side, with equal force, right? So we won't find stillness and peace and settle in the middle until we respond to that restriction. So I think you have to see that as a signal that there's some kind of lingering deprivation that we need to heal. Has anybody ever noticed or want to share when they, when they generally stress eat or feel themselves like emotionally eating or, you know, like mindlessly eating? Generally, what does, what, what does that come from? What do you notice like about your day or your eating habits of that day? Have you generally eaten all of your food portions that day? Have you eaten like enough breakfast, lunch? A lot of times when people are stress eating or overeating or hangry, it's because you haven't eaten enough. Somebody says, I eat extremely healthfully at home, but when I go to a party and see a buffet of cookies, chips, et cetera, I always overeat. So let me ask you a question. Um, when you say extremely healthfully, the day of a party, essentially, um, what does that look like? And then also, do you allow yourself to eat chips, cookies, et cetera? Otherwise, that's what you have to think about. So, you never have chips or cookies or anything at home. So, that's why. That's why you would binge on those things because you never allow yourself to eat them at your house. So, this is exactly what I was talking about with the peanut butter pretzels. When um, I never buy them. So then, you know, when I would go to my mom's house, um, and she would have them there, then I would overeat them because they would be there and they would be in front of me. And I haven't had them in months because I, I never buy them because they're bad for me. Right. That's how I would see them. They're bad for me. And then I would overeat them. But then I just, then, and then after I would leave there, you have a feeling of guilt and I have a feeling that I shouldn't eat them. And then I don't, and then, and then I'm back not buying them anymore. I can't buy them anymore. And then I go back to my mom's house and she has, it, and it's a bad cycle. So how do I get out of this? I go and I buy the peanut butter pretzels and I have peanut butter pretzels in my cabinet now and I don't overeat them. They've been in there for weeks. It takes me weeks to go through a container because I take a little bit at a time when I feel like sometimes I have to remind my, I open up the cabinet and forget that they're in there because they're just so, they don't have power over me anymore. So I think that I'm, I'm 
Thank you for sharing that because I think that's a perfect example of um, kind of how we restrict ourselves so much from the things that we would consider to be bad to the point of then we overeat them at a party because we only stick to the healthy things at home. So that's a perfect example. And it, it, it takes time. Um, somebody asked how long did it take to normalize? Um, I don't really know the exact time. And I, I think every food might be different for you. Um, it, it really depends. It could be weeks. You know, it could be, it could be a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of days maybe of you eating a food. And that doesn't mean that you like binge on it until you get used to it. Maybe that's just eating a handful of the food every day until maybe you forget about it. Um, I think you just kind of have to sit with each one and see how long, you know, it takes. And then you move on to the next one and give each food the time that it needs. Um, sorry, I think I missed a comment here. Um, somebody said, working as a nanny, um, I find myself eating toddler snacks and food and then passing by my lunch or even eating my lunch after finishing snack time. Okay, so are you, um, are you trying to like break out of that habit or are you, are you seeing that as something that you have evolved to doing or working past? Give me a little bit more context there. Um, Somebody mentioned, the question is, what about healthy dupes of favorite foods or low calorie versions, AKA cauliflower pizza versus low cal uh, real pizza? So I think the question is, are you trying to, you're saying like doing like um, Halo Top instead of ice cream or cauliflower pizza versus real pizza? Um, yes. So I think um, it kind of depends. It, uh, it depends. For an instance, like Halo Top versus regular ice cream, the ingredients in Halo Top are crappy. You know, like if you read the ingredient label, it's all erythritol, you know, like those are artificial sweeteners. Um, they're not good for you, they're all chemicals. So I would much rather see you actually eat real good quality ice cream where the ingredients are cream and um, milk and dark chocolate and actual, food items and not chemicals. So in a case with something like that, I would say, I would rather see you go for the real thing and just eat a portion size and, and have that and move on from it. Um, as far as pizza, I, I would almost say the same thing unless you have some type of like allergy to gluten and you need to have the cauliflower. Um, a lot of times if you're an on point client, we would actually count a cauliflower crust as a starch in most cases anyway, because it usually ends up having like potato flour in it, as does like cauliflower gnocchi. Um, so unless you absolutely just like really like cauliflower crust, I don't know that it like is a healthier substitution because it usually has cheese as a, or egg as a binder and ends up being just as caloric, if not more. So, um, I think that's also like a diet culture thing. You know, it's kind of like a lower calorie option that seems like it's healthier, but maybe not. So I think maybe ask yourself why you want that option and is it actually better? And do you actually want that or do you just want it because you, you think you should? Um, I think this is a, okay, good. So I think this is a clarification on the nanny, trying to find balance with intuitive eating and not eating what's in front of me because it's in front of me. So you can ask yourself that question. Like that's, that goes back to having that conversation with yourself of, am I actually hungry? Am I listening to my body? Um, do I actually want this food? Is this what I need right now? So maybe that will go, that is kind of like what we're talking about on slide seven here a little bit. So that could be this first kind of like um, bullet here is 
principle seven is about coping with your emotions with kindness. But I kind of like materialize that as emotional stress, binge, mindless, bored eating. So emotional eating is a response to deprivation. So in this case, is it bored eating that you're experiencing when you're nannying and eating the snacks? So is it kind of like you're just eating it because it's there? So are you in a state of um, boredom? I think the, the thing to do in that case is ask yourself, what are you feeling right now? And then maybe respond to yourself with, what do I need right now in terms of food and maybe in addition to food? So if you're wondering if that's, if you're eating because of boredom and that's because that's in front of you, ask yourself like, okay, what can I do right now besides eat this if, if I don't really actually want this snack? If you're nannying, do the kids need to go outside and play? How long has it been since I've eaten? Am I actually hungry? Do I need to go for a walk? Am I bored? Do I want to watch a show? Is there something that you could be doing besides maybe like eating a snack? So maybe identify the emotion that you're experiencing and then figure out how to respond to that aside from food. So a lot of times, to kind of circle back, we're using food to cope with emotions when um, really stress eating, emotional eating, whatnot, is really a response to deprivation. So as we were talking about before, um, somebody had mentioned like um, binge eating, maybe like not binge eating, but overeating sweets at a party it's kind of a response to deprivation. So restricting sweets or whatnot all day or, or just in your house forces you to overeat them at a party. Um, it kind of like puts our body into like a starvation or like restriction mode and dieting and restricting foods creates a chronic sense of deprivation. So there's always some type of like hunger going on. So <clears throat> if you recognize that you do restrict yourself from eating certain things and you feel deprived, consider that deprivation might actually be the root of what you think is emotional eating and not emotions at all. So prioritize letting go of restrictions and eating enough. And I think that you'll find that emotions of, I'm sorry, episodes of emotional eating will decline. So prioritize making a list of those off-limits foods and trying to introduce them, listening to your hunger signals, honoring your hunger, listening to your fullness, and then seeing if those things decline. If you truly have stopped depriving yourself and you're still experiencing very frequent episodes of emotional eating, whatever we want to call it, it may be because you're turning to food to help you through difficult times. And in those times, eating is really just a coping skill. So again, I encourage you to kind of like dig deep and turn within and ask yourself that question. What am I feeling right now? And what do I need to do in terms of food or in addition to food or aside from food? What do I need? Are you feeling stressed? What are ways that you can deal with stress? Maybe it is a workout, but maybe it's not. What helps you relax? Do you like to read? Meditation, a walk, a bath, call a friend, Zoom with a friend, cooking. Are you feeling sleepy? Do you need a nap? Maybe you're feeling happy. Somebody mentioned on the last call that they just were just, maybe it was like, um, I forget what the emotion was, boredom or just, just wanted to eat. Maybe you're feeling happy and you want to eat because it's celebratory. But there's another way that you can kind of attend to that that doesn't include food. So I encourage you to think about that maybe before you spiral down that 
coal. But kind of first, utilize some of these other tools and principles of intuitive eating. So again, to kind of piggyback off of what I was just saying, um, if you do recognize that you've been eating more intuitively and listening to your hunger signals and you still feel out of control, you might need to dig a little bit deeper and identify your emotions. So ask yourself what you're feeling, then figure out how to tend to those emotions. Also, if you do this practice and your answer to that is nothing, you just need food, you just want food, then trust that. It probably means that what you were labeling as emotional eating could mean hunger. So don't force yourself to use any coping skills in addition to food if all you really need in that moment is food. Any other questions, discussion? I know I gave you guys a lot of info. I talked for a while. I thank you guys so much for sharing all of these comments and um, experiences too. That was great. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see. Does anybody have anything that you wanna share? Feel free to unmute yourself too at this point. So um, I know these were, you know, they can, they were pretty lengthy with the PowerPoint and whatnot. Um, there's a lot, there's so much more to intuitive eating. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight over these two webinars, um, some of the things that I think are the most helpful, especially for our on-point nutrition clients. Um, both of these recorded, or both of these webinars are recorded and will live on the member portal. So if you missed the first one, I encourage you to go back and look at it. As always, please feel free to send me an email if you have any additional questions. I would love to chat with you aside from this. Um, you're welcome. I see some thank yous coming through. You're welcome. And um, feel free to reach out to your dietitian if you need any additional tools. There are things that we can add to your Nudge apps if you need anything additional that would help you track any type of hunger signals, notes, if you want to track um, you know, how you're feeling with stress eating, anything that will help you. So feel free to just ask for help and, um, have some new webinar content coming for you guys soon. So hope to see you guys in a couple weeks. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you. Bye.